Number three, integrated concepts. You have a grindstone, a disc that is 90 kilograms and has a 0.34 meter radius and is turning at 90 RPM. And you press a steel axe against it with a radial force of 20 newtons. Letter A, assuming the kinetic coefficient of friction between the steel and the stone is 0.2, calculate the angular acceleration of the grindstone. All right, um, so here's a little picture. The grindstone has a certain angular velocity. They tell us it is 90 RPM. We're going to take a steel axe and press it into this wheel. And obviously we know just intuitively the wheel is going to slow down, right? So it should have some uh, negative angular uh, acceleration, okay? Now, first things first, I just always like to look at the units. I notice here I have RPM. I don't like that. Uh, nothing personal, of course, just we need radians uh, per second. So I'm going to convert the 90 revolutions per minute into radians per second. Do it at the top here. So here we have 90 revolutions per minute. Then basically multiply this by, uh, for every one revolution, there are two pi radians. And then we got to get rid of the minutes. So in one minute, there are 60 seconds. And just plug it into the calculator. So it's 90 times 2 times pi, all divided by 60. And we get a value of approximately uh, 9.42 9.42 radians per second. And this is the, and I'll just move it over here. This is the initial angular velocity before the uh, steel axe is applied. All right, so now let's think about, okay, so let's think about now the mechanics of the problem. So right here is, is the point of interest, right? There is a certain axe. There is a force being applied, okay, a radial force. Basically what that means is a force towards the center, okay, of the circle or of the, uh, yeah, of the circular uh, path. So if there is a force that the axe is producing on the wheel pointing to the right, then we know the wheel is exerting a force back on this axe in the exact opposite direction, right? Which would be pointed this way, okay? So in terms of now, let me do this as a free body diagram where this point will represent the origin, okay? So I'll do it down here. So we have a force being applied to the right uh, of 20 newtons. And then the wheel will be producing an equal but opposite force back on the X. Okay, I'll write that in the picture. And that'll be 20 newtons pointing that way. Now this force right here is essentially the normal force, right? If you think about what the nature of the normal force is, right, you're used to seeing a problem where some weight, right, is, has a, is resting on the ground and then the ground is pushing back up with some normal force, right? So it's the same idea. It's just kind of turned, rotated 90 degrees, okay? This applied force here is acting like the weight. And then the force the wheel is pushing back on that ax is acting like the normal force, okay? So hopefully that clears it up a little bit. All right, so now, okay. So now can we find the frictional force that's being produced? Well, yes, right, we can. If we think about the frictional force formula, we know that the force of friction, and kinetic friction that is, is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction multiplied by the normal force. So we do know that uh, this a, a uh, frictional force is being applied at this particular location. Okay, now let me ask you a question. In what direction would this frictional force be pointing? Remember the main concept of friction, okay? Uh, friction always opposes motion. That's it. So if the object here is rotating counterclockwise and the point of interest is right here, the friction will oppose this counterclockwise rotation or this rotation in the down direction, right? At this exact instant right here, we know we have a motion pointing directly down. Friction will oppose it, and therefore, friction's vector will be pointing upward. Okay, this vector right here that I just drew represents the force of friction. Now, hopefully, I was going to ask, are there any questions, but I, I, I realize that, I mean, you could answer, but that would be weird since you'd be talking to the computer screen. 
um, and and nobody's actively on the other side. So here, what we what we realize now, the nature right of what's happening here is that there is a force being applied tangentially, okay, or perpendicularly to the axis of rotation, which is right here. Here's the axis of rotation, right here. This force is acting at a distance, right, to that axis of rotation. So I can draw that in, right? This is the radius, right? I mean, it's the same value as I have over here, okay? That's the 0.34 meters that told, that told us in the problem. This is R, and this vector right here is F, right? And you have something, you have some force being applied at a, at a distance to the axis of rotation. That should sound like the prior chapter, right? Torque, you got a torque going on here, okay? So what that means is that since we have torque being produced and the problem is not static, it is dynamic, we now cannot say, cannot say that the sum of the torques in the problem will equal zero. We cannot say that because the problem is dynamic, right? Meaning the wheel is experiencing a, uh, an angular acceleration. So remember, we had this basic formula before that the sum of the forces is equal to uh, mass times acceleration. Well, we have a very, very similar analog in rotational dynamics, right? I'll actually leave it up so you can see the similarity. So we have this formula right over here on the right-hand side, that the sum of the torques will equal the moment of inertia, which is similar to the mass, not exactly, but similar, multiplied by the angular acceleration, all right? So whenever you have... Uh, torques in a problem and it's dynamically rotating, you have to use this formula, not this one. Okay, the reason why is because the I is really what, I mean, there's a few reasons, but the uh, moment of inertia is really what you have to pin down in order to answer this question properly. So let's just erase this for now. I'm going to bring this front and center, move it on up over here. Okay, so now remember, okay, the torque the sum of the torques. There's basically one torque in the problem that we just described, okay? It is the torque being produced by friction. And therefore, I know I am only dealing with one torque that's slowing the wheel down. So I can say now, instead of writing this as the sum of the torques, I can say that it's the torque due to friction, right? That will be causing a change in the rotation. And that will equal then, because this is the only torque, uh, equal then the moment of inertia multiplied by the angular acceleration. Now, what sign is this? If we think back to the last chapter, here's a force that's being applied at a distance to the axis of rotation. If this force is applied, it would rotate the wheel clockwise, right? And if it rotates the wheel clockwise, that means it is a negative torque. Okay, so now I have this equation right here. All right, wonderful. So now let's remember that the torque of friction, we can expand on that from the last chapter. Remember, torque is equal to, I mean, if it's perpendicular, right, it's basically just equal to the force applied multiplied by the lever arm, the perpendicular lever arm, that is. Okay, so that's a, that, there's a concept from the prior chapter, right? I didn't write it down in the formula sheet, but there's a lot of formula I can't, uh, you know, there's only so much room. Um, so now I can write negative, right, substitute in the force of friction multiplied by the perpendicular lever arm of that frictional force should equal, and let me move this on over because I don't want it to get, uh, you know, it's just not a subtraction. I'm gonna just move it down here, okay? Is equal to then moment of inertia times now my angular acceleration. So I wanna find angular acceleration. Remember, that's what they're asking us for. So I know in order to solve this thing, I just have to divide out my I. So getting this in terms of alpha, it would now be negative the force of friction multiplied by that perpendicular lever arm, which is basically the radius, divided it by now the moment of inertia. So the only thing we haven't really discussed is what is this moment of inertia thing? Well, this moment of inertia thing changes. Okay, it's a little complicated, but not bad. There's a, I forgot where the chart is, but there's a chart in your book that, uh, you know, gives you pictures like this, gives you moment of inertias for different objects rotating about different axes. 
all right now you have to you will become proficient at picking out the proper picture you got to think about the nature of what's going on here in this photo okay the axis of rotation is right down the middle of this cylinder essentially okay it's a solid cylinder because it's a grindstone so this whole thing is shaded this whole thing is is uh, filled it's not a ring right around the outside uh, so I know I'm dealing with some type of solid cylinder so I go and I look in my chart here's the solid cylinder right here's a solid cylinder and what where's the axis of rotation in this picture relative to the cylinder well it's right in the middle right it'd be like it'd be an axis pointing directly into and out of the page here which is exactly what this picture is showing right it here's the axis going right through the cylinder okay so I know then the for the moment of inertia I know this is my appropriate formula where M stands for the mass, R stands for the distance between the axis of rotation and the point mass, okay? Um, or in this particular case, since there is no particular point mass, it's evenly distributed, so we can just assume that this R is the entire radius, all right, of the cylinder, and all that thing divided, all that divided by two. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to take this and substitute it on in for I, okay? So let's do that. So alpha will be equal to negative. Now, all right, I'll just, I'll plug it in as I see it, and then I'm just gonna do a little algebra over now. And of course, we're running out of space. Okay, over now, m r squared all over two. This two, I could really bring up into the numerator, which I'm going to do just so I have a little more room. So this would be equal to now two, Okay, two times this divided by then the mass of the disk multiplied then by the radius of that disk squared. So here it is. Here's my formula, ladies and gentlemen. Now all I need to do is just plug it on in. All right, so I'm going to do it over here on the left-hand side. Let me just move this over. So here we have alpha now. The angular acceleration is equal to negative 2 multiplied now by the uh, force of friction, which we said was going to be coefficient times the normal force. So I actually... I really should have done another substitution here to bring this on in. Okay, but I think, you, uh, just to save a little space, actually, you know what? I'm gonna just start writing up here. So this is gonna be negative, This is. I'm sorry guys, this is all over the place. <laughs> negative two times coefficient of kinetic friction, which is 0.2, times then the normal force, which we said was tw uh, uh, 20, okay? And then, that whole thing, so that takes care of my force of friction, right? I basically just took this and plugged it on in. Multiplied then by the perpendicular lever arm, which is just the radius, which is 0 0.34, okay? All divided by the mass of the object, which was 90 kilograms, multiplied by r squared, right? Which is 0 0.34 squared. You know, I could have simplified this. I mean, a total simplified, some professors go crazy. They just want the form, not crazy, but... They just want the formulas. They don't even want you to calculate. So the final formula here would be something like this. Negative, it would be negative 2 times the coefficient of kinetic friction multiplied by the normal force, all divided by then the mass times r. Because the perpendicular lever arm here is a radius, and this is a radius squared, so I can cancel this term on the top and one of them on the bottom. All right. So this would be the overall formula. Okay. Oh my goodness. Are you guys having fun? Because I'm I'm having a lot of fun. I don't know about you. So we got negative 2 times 0.2 times 20 times... Eh, forget about it. I'll just use a simplified equation. Less chance for error. Divided by 90. Don't forget your parentheses like I just did. Times 90 times 0.34. So here's our value. So we get a value of negative 0.26. Okay, and that is radians per second squared. All right, that is the answer to letter A. Now, letter B. How many turns will the stone make before coming to rest? Okay, so now, uh, in order to answer this question, let me, let me first start by saying something like this. I know the equations from linear uh, kinematics is, or should be very familiar, right? So we have the final velocity squared is equal to the initial velocity squared 
plus two times the acceleration multiplied by the displacement, change in displacement, that is. Now, all those uh, linear kinematic equations have their analog in rotational kinematics. So, for example, I can take this equation and just plug in the rotational analogs, and I have now my rotational kinematic equation. For example, linear final velocity is basically the analog in angular uh, kinematics would be angular velocity, omega that is, and that'll be the final velocity squared. Then we have an initial velocity linear, but the analog in rotational will be angular velocity. So we have now omega i squared. Plus then, right, plus two times, this is the linear acceleration, but in, rota in rotational kinematics, it is angular acceleration, which is alpha, multiplied by alpha. And then here is the displacement, linear displacement, and in rotational kinematics, it is the angular displacement, or omega, uh, not omega, oh my goodness. <laughs> Like literally everything in my head just like poop just left I, I theta there it is that was a weird that's weird as my son says that's weird all right so this is now the rotational analog so basically all we need to now do is plug in the values because we have everything we know the final rotational velocity or angular velocity it's zero it says it's coming to rest. Right, the initial, we know it's over here. We calculated it before, 9.42. We just calculated the angular acceleration. So here we're going to find the angular displacement. Now you might say, well, wait a minute. The question is, how many turns? Right? Isn't this in terms of uh, radians? And yes, that is correct. In other words, instead of asking how many turns, you could have said how many revolutions. Right? They're the same. And now you might see the connection. All right? We basically just, at the end, have to convert radians to revolutions. So let's plug in the values, all right? Or let's actually solve this for um, theta. So theta will be equal to the final velocity, the final angular velocity squared minus the initial angular velocity squared, all divided by then two times our alpha, all right? So this is zero squared minus then 9.42 squared all divided then by two times our alpha, which was negative 0.26. Okay, and now just plug it on into the calculator. And I just erased that value. All right, so here we put it in. Okay, so here we have 9.42 squared divided by now two times that answer. And we get a value of now, and it should be, so let me, Oh man, I have no space. I'm going to put it over here, guys. Right, right here. All right. So now we have omega is equal to 160, uh, about 170, right? I mean, if if we take uh, significant figures into account and whatnot, so we get a value of about 170. So 170, and that is in radians. Now remember, that's not exactly the answer, okay? We need it in revolutions, essentially. So you just gotta take this value and divide it by now two pi. We're just doing a conversion, okay? So take that value, divide it now by two times pi, and what do we get? We get a value of uh, 27, right? So here, so the number of turns that it will make will be basically exact, almost exactly 27, oh, 27 revolutions. Okay, this is the final answer for letter B. Guys, thank you very much for tuning in. Please remember to hit that subscribe button. All right, and I look forward to helping you with the next question. Take care.